The gentleman from Washington, Mr. Pillian. Point of personal privilege. The gentleman has the floor. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, members of the House. House Bills 2161, 62, 63, 64, 65, and 67 are, are on the second reading uncontested calendar today. This legislation is the result of a collaboration of stakeholders who understand the gravity of the opioid epidemic in Virginia. Virginia is on track to meet Department of Health projections of over 1,000 fatal opioid overdoses in 2016, the highest in the history of the Commonwealth. Weeks ago, the Department of Social Services released data showing that the number of children exposed to drugs in utero increased 21 percent to over 1,300 in 2016. And while the opioid epidemic is a statewide crisis, it's very important to me because I represent three of the top five counties with the highest fatal overdoses, overdose rates in the Commonwealth over the last 10 years. Mr. Speaker, I can continue with a litany of numbers and facts and figures that demonstrate the severity of the crisis, but today I want to tell this body a couple of personal stories. I begin with the story of Lucy, who came to my dental practice um, when she was two years old. Lucy was born prematurely, 10 weeks earlier than she should have been because of lack of prenatal care. Her first sensation upon delivery wasn't the warm lights of the room or the nurturing hold of her mother. Lucy's first sensation was one of starvation, not the type of hunger that you or I feel when we skip a meal. She had the type of starvation for a drug that her mother had used throughout her pregnancy. Lucy spent the next four months being held by nurses and NICU volunteers, constantly convulsing, seizing, and being inconsolable until the drugs had finally worked their way out of her system. When Lucy left the hospital, she was placed in a loving foster home because her parents had chosen their drug addiction over their child. House Bill 2162 specifically deals with substance-exposed infants to identify existing resources and for the removal of barriers to treatment. With the average cost of neonatal abstinence syndrome at $70,000 and an average of 16 days in the hospital, it would reason that we would want to do everything possible to prevent this. The next story I want to share with you is the story of a physician friend of mine from Southwest Virginia. This emergency room doctor was contacted by a local production-driven Suboxone clinic with a job opportunity that he had a hard time turning down. He was offered $18,000 per month to work one day per week in a Suboxone clinic. This offer entailed no counseling requirement for his patients, nothing other than a DEA number, a one-hour online course, and a promise that if he saw more than the suggested 100 patients, the administrator would handle the slap on his wrist. Just last year, the Department of Health and Human Services raised the limit to 275 patients per doctor, potentially compounding the problem. For a student that graduates med school with over $200,000 of debt or more, the lucrative enticements that that bad Suboxone clinic offered would be tempting. To that end, House Bill 2161 focuses on developing core competency and standards for our health professionals in training. House Bill 2163 addresses the dangers of buprenorphine without naloxone when used in medication-assisted treatment. Because my physician's friend's mother had been an addict, he declined the job and now works in the emergency room preventing overprescribing. Mr. Speaker, we know medication-assisted treatment like Suboxone has a needed role in recovery. However, trading one addiction for another is no longer acceptable. We have an addiction crisis that didn't begin yesterday, but is a result of years of overprescribing. We can no longer just point the finger at the addict. It's time that we, as prescribers, just like myself, have to turn that finger back on us. We can't arrest our way out of this crisis anymore. The final story, and I want everyone to listen to this story because it could happen to any of us, is with the story of Josh. Josh is a 31-year-old Air Force veteran. He was raised by well-respected veteran parents in northern Virginia suburbia. When Josh was 24, he suffered a neck injury in a car accident. When he was sitting in the ER, he left with a 90-day opioid prescription. By the time he left and reached the bottom of his pill bottle, Josh was an addict, 
Unknown to his family, his addiction continued for seven years and ultimately progressed to heroin. The family discovered his addiction and have been working with Josh in his recovery. He is currently doing very well and continues working on his recovery in an outpatient uh, program, and he's been clean for 60 days. It's a day-to-day struggle that has his parents praying and constantly asking people for support. In conjunction with Delegate Hugo's efforts in House Bill 1885, House Bill 2167 directs the Board of Medicine and Dentistry to develop regulations on prescribing of opioids and buprenorphine, including dosage limitations, treatment plans, and PMP utilization. Mr. Speaker, this crisis affects everyone. It's not just someone else's problem anymore. This problem has a victim in this very body, And I'm grateful that Delegate John Bell allowed me to share his story of his son, Josh, this morning in hopes of helping others take away the stigma of addiction. I'm confident that the measures that this body take before them today are important steps that will help prevent more lives from being lost from the epidemic. I ask for your support. Thank you.